Support for another round comes from Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com today for a domain experience that's transparent and easy to set up. Just make sure you enter offer code another round at checkout to get 10% off. Make your next move with Squarespace. Support for another round comes from Blue Apron. Take the stress out of cooking this year and create a winning dish from Blue Apron that everyone will love. Get $30 off your first meal with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash another. Hey, everybody. It's Tracy and Heaven. Hi, friends. We are here to bring you an encore episode featuring our interview with the one and only amazing artist, Tatiana Fazlali Zade, which is a very fun name to say. It is so beautiful. It's like, I feel like I'm singing when I say Ooh, her name. Oh, yes. Right? Give me that melody. Yeah. Fazlali Zade. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know how lately we've been like, men are trash, burn it all down. <laughs> <laughs> More so than usual. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Um, this conversation will speak to that part of your heart that is on fire. <laughs> it sure will. Uh, with all the Harvey Weinstein shit, the Donald Trump shit, the rape culture shit, <sighs> and all the general shit out there. Yes. Um, general we'll- shit. <laughs> he sounds like a terrible military guy. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to remind you that there are people who are out here fighting and resisting in so many ways. Mm. Tatiana is doing this via art. If you have seen, if you've been on Tumblr or if you've walked around Brooklyn, you may have seen some amazing um, wheat paste pieces that say things like stop telling women to smile. Women are not outside for your entertainment and harassing women. And harassing women does not prove your masculinity. Mm. Hello. Wow. Absolutely. So women like her. Artists like her are out here doing really, really hard, really amazing work. And this was a great conversation. Mm. I feel like now more than ever, like, just listen to women. Listen to women making Seriously. art. Listen to women not making art. Listen mm-hmm. to all the women. <laughs> and listen to the things that the art says. Mm. Literally, leave us alone. Stop telling women to smile. Y'all. Stop acting like I owe you shit. Woo. <sighs> this is a bit of a church episode, given yes. the landscape. Woosa. Woo. Mm. Let's woosa together with Tatiana <laughs> Fazlali Zade. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Heaven. I'm Tracy. And welcome to another round with Heaven and Tracy. Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow, wow, <laughs> you sound <wow>. like <laughs> the CSI. <laughs> Not CSI. Where the guy puts on his glasses. The fucking like, sunglasses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the show's about to start. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Uh, what do we have this episode, Tracy? I am excited for everything that we have coming up. You know how you love to quiz me on white dudes' names <laughs> and I fail in front of all of America every time? <laughs> yes, all of America's it's listening. It's <laughs> my turn to quiz you. Ooh. I'm so excited. We're going to quiz you on some Southern phrases. Oh, God, I'm nervous. You should be. What else Wah-ha-ha-ha. is in this episode? <laughs> also, we have one of my favorite visual artists and a friend of mine, Miss Tatiana Fazlali Zade who is the creator of the Stop Telling Women to Smile Street Project, among other fantastic things. And we're also going to do a great kindness to the men out there by telling them what they are doing wrong. Again. So we're bringing back our segment, Men Gotta Do Better. Because y'all still gotta do better. Let's start the show. Let's start the show. All right, I'm ready for this quiz, Tracy. Oh, man, I'm excited. For the first time in another round history, I get to quiz heaven on something that she probably knows nothing about, maybe. I know nothing, so this is a good (laughs) assumption. (laughs) I feel like once per episode, somebody says a phrase and you're like, what does that mean? Yeah, that that describes my life. (laughs) Yes. Also, with me coming from very, very country folks, especially my grandmother, she always had like these very colorful southern expressions that she would say all the time so much that I've picked up on them and sometimes I'll say something super country and I won't realize it until until somebody's like wait what does that mean a pig in who what happened I mean I'm used to these because um like my mom is like the proverb queen (laughs) she'd be like you know what the elephant says to the whatever and, and be like so that's why you should clean your room. <laughs> like, mom, what? <laughs> so I love it. I love those, but this is just like in a different language for me. Yes, it's going to be great. Southerners will read you to filth and it will sound like poetry. <laughs> yeah. So I'm so excited I to, love it already. to do this. So this game is called Guess the Southern Phrase. I just made up that title. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you some multiple choice questions. Mm-hmm. You pick the word that you believe completes oh, the southern phrase. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. When someone is really, really joyous. Oh, my God. <laughs> they are said to be happy as a pig in what? Heat, July, heaven, or slop? I don't even know how to start eliminating these. You gotta do it. Gotta work it out. <laughs> um, I don't know. All animals in heat seem like they're not. They're happy, but they're not. Okay. Is that your answer? I'm going to go with in heat. Wrong. Oh, my God. But I don't even know why I chose that by my own logic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, <laughs> the correct answer is slop. Okay. Happy as a that pig That should have been an easy one. I'm slop. sorry. I started with the easy one. We're going to turn it up. I feel like I may have said this to you the other day. When one is naked, <laughs> like completely naked, they are said to be naked as a what? A jaybird? A piglet? A brand new badger or a new day? <laughs> a brand new badger? That came from your head. <laughs> you did say this to me and I've been paying attention. Damn it! Even though all birds are naked. <laughs> it's naked as a jaybird. You're correct. Ding, ding, ding. Hmm. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay, this is one of my favorite ones. Okay. When it's really, really, really hot outside, it is said to be hotter than a billy goat's ass. <laughs> In a blank patch. Oh, my God. Is it pumpkin, pepper, chili, or potato? Why is a billy goat in any of this situation? Hey, man. <laughs> hey, they like to eat vegetables. Okay, I'm going to go with the heat vibes. Okay. So I'm going with either chili or pepper. Okay. I'm I'm assuming like they want the most exaggerated version of this. I'm going to go with pepper. You're right. Yes! Look, Look at that process of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> I learned from the other one where I didn't apply my own logic. Okay, okay. When something really irritates you, you say, that really blanks my pickle. <laughs> <laughs> Is it tickles, pokes, dills, or bites? <laughs> that tickles my pickles. <laughs> What was the other one? I couldn't get over the rhyme. <laughs> Tickles, pokes, dills, or bites. What? What? I guess irritation is like someone poking you. Okay. So your pokes answer my is... pickle. <laughs> Good alliteration there. But it... That, okay. I'm going to go with that, even though it sounds horrible. Pokes? Yes. Wrong. Oh. Eh. Buzz. The answer is dills. What that really that deals mean? my pickle. Nothing. <laughs> it means even, nothing at what all. What is a dill? Like a dill pickle. But like, is that like a specific type? Of pickle? Yeah. But like, how yes. do you dill up? Like, you use dill in the... Is it an action? It seems it's, like a verb in this sentence. It's a verb in this in this phrase, but it's not a verb in real life. What? Hey, poetic how? license, man. <laughs> I was trying to use logic. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be the last question. When someone is really confused, it is said <laughs> <laughs> that they are confused as a blank in a fan factory. Okay, I'm already out. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we in a fan factory? <laughs> is it a breeze, a fart, a flower, or a skunk? You definitely made up fart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're confused? Yes. Confused as a blank in a fan factory. Oh man, I'm so stumped. Right <laughs> <laughs> Evan was gently stroking her cheek with, with her brow furrowed. I feel like the skunk would be like thrown off by the smell, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, where's that coming from? I'm in a fan factory. It could be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to go with skunk. That's very impressive logic, but it is wrong. <laughs> it's fart. Confused Are you as kidding a fart me? in a fan factory. <laughs> you didn't make that up. I did not. Make oh that my up. god! <laughs> what does that mean? It. I mean, imagine a fart in a fan factory. It's like, whoa, where am I going? There's so many fans. <laughs> I want to go this way, but I can't get over there. Oh my gosh! I can't follow this train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a fart is thinking. <laughs> yeah, you did okay. It's not bad. Uh, it was okay. Not bad. I'm gonna save the hard ones for the next the next time. I won't be able to remember what the real phrase is and what are the ones you made up. So I'm gonna be like, it's like a skunk in a fan factory, <laughs> <laughs> and no one will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I will do one 
somehow an Ethiopian version of this. Ethiopian Ooh, proverbs. <laughs> I'm so excited. And like translate them all and yes. try to make it fun instead of like hearing my mom's voice Please telling me do. to clean my room. <laughs> <laughs> As you guys know, we have a little call-in section where we ask questions and love to hear from your awesome voices. This question today, dun, dun, dun. this month's question, this time's question, <laughs> uh, our question now is for best friends. Hey, go best friend. That's my best friend. That's hey. my best friend. For this call-in segment, we want you guys to like sit down and interview each other, like best friends talking to best friends. <laughs> so we came up with a few questions that you can use as starting off points. What do you love about your breast, your breast friend? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, 12. I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you love about your best friend the most? What is a fear that your best friend has helped or is helping you through? And what's something that your best friend did recently that made you feel really proud? Oh, man. Aww. I feel like I'm going to cry through all of these. Oh <laughs> I'm gosh. already crying. <laughs> Evan, do you have a, a best friend story you would like to share? Oh, no, oh I'm going to cry. Okay. No, 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 no. No best friend stories from heaven. Um, <laughs> shout out to Mani. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really proud of she's been dealing with grief mm. the last year. And I'm just she's such a strong person. I'm so impressed Aww. with how she lives her life with like kindness and empathy. Aww. We were talking about Stephen Colbert's uh, interview in GQ. Mm -hmm. You have to read it, obviously. Colbert, if you're listening, please come on. Please the show. call us. Please call <laughs> but us. But he has this incredible line about he's talking about uh, the death of his family members and how it was an important, like seminal moment in his life, like and how the worst thing that happened to him. The worst thing that happened to him is also the best. Mm. Anyways, it's a lot. Shout out to best friends who hold you down in those moments. Aww, I'm so proud of you, Mani. Best friend, that's my best friend. That's my best friend. Yes. We need to find her and get her on the show. Oh my god! And I would love to interview them stories. about their best friendship. Yes. Anyways, guys, keep it under a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we do. <laughs> Record it on your voice memo app and send it to another round at BuzzFeed.com. We want to hear from you, best friends. <laughs> I'm so excited for these. I love hearing your voices, guys. Aww. Support for another round comes from Squarespace. With Squarespace, you get a unique domain experience that's simple to set up and an all-in-one platform to help you create a beautiful, modern website that's nothing like those old dial-up websites. Remember that sound? To help quiz me on some other old-school tech sounds, I have with me in the stew Tyler Sorensen of BuzzFeed's creative department. How you doing, Tyler? Doing well, Tracy. I have one sound for you. You might recognize this. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. I'm ready to win. Here it is. Oh, we're sorry. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Yeah. Please check the number and try your call again. You ever get that message? Oh, man, I sure did. I gave that message a lot, too, back in the day. <laughs> when uh, <laughs> when you give somebody a fake phone number and then oh. they try to call you, that's what they would hear. Get your unique domain today at squarespace.com. If you sign up for a year, the domain is free, and you can also save 10% off your first purchase with the offer code Another Round. Make your next move with Squarespace. Thanksgiving is a stressful time of year in the kitchen, and with everyone expected to bring a dish or two, the pressure is definitely on. Fortunately, Blue Apron has created special Thanksgiving side kits for just this reason. Here's why you should consider Blue Apron this year. Number one, they are perfect for Friendsgiving. At your annual potluck, you can bring a winning dish from Blue Apron that everyone will love. Number two, Blue Apron takes the stress out of cooking. In the weeks leading up to the holidays, you can finesse your cooking skills and gain culinary confidence just in time for the most important meal of the year. Number three, you'll spend less time at the grocery store. Skip the crazy crowds and long lines and let Blue Apron deliver its dynamic recipes and high quality ingredients to you. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first meal with free shipping by going to blueapron.com another. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com another. Blue Apron, a better way to cook.
So we have a super, super special treat for our listeners today because we have in the studio the super talented artist and illustrator in the force behind the Stop Telling Women a Smile street art project, which you may have seen in your own neighborhoods, Miss Tatiana Fazlalizade. Hey, hey, girl. Welcome. <laughs> hey. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So the first question that we ask all of our guests is, what do you do and why? Well, I am... An artist, I do multiple things within that title, artist. I am primarily an oil painter, traditional painter, um, but I also do street art, as we just mentioned, public art, murals, as long as I'm focusing on what is important to me. So thinking about things like race and gender um, and social issues that affect us. So that is what I do, and I do it because I love to do it. I'm good at it. I think that it's important to address the things that I'm addressing in my work. Um, and I think that it's important to use visual art, and my art in particular, to not just be aesthetically pleasing, but to also have some type of voice behind it. So Awesome. I think you may be the first person that I can remember who has said, because I'm good at it, and their reason for it. Yes. Like, I, mean, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of introduce you to our um, listeners because you and I have known each other for like a thousand years. We have. Which is crazy. I know. Um, so just give us a little bit of background. Where are you from? How did you get into art? When did you know that this is the thing that you wanted to do like forever and for serious? Mm -hmm. um, well, I am originally from Oklahoma City. I lived in Philadelphia for about nine, almost ten years. And that's how... Um, you and I, Tracy, and I know each other. Um, <laughs> I began creating art when I was in high school. So I wasn't one of those kids that was drawing and painting all the time when they were like little. Um, I didn't really pick it up until later in my high school career. Oh and my God, this gives me hope. Right. <laughs> you know, you can be an artist too. <laughs> yeah, it, and it's funny because my mother is an artist. She um, is a painter, uh, created different types of art. Did you and find yourself wanting to like recreate the visual language your mom used? I did in a way. Mm -hmm. My mother was, and she still is, but she was very black when I was growing up. <laughs> she was <laughs> Wait, the best the <laughs> She was definitely one of those like boho, um, very radical black folks in mm -hmm. Oklahoma. Dreadlocks, she wore, you know, African garb all the time. She kept books around the house that were just about blackness and, and by all these black authors. And and so I started creating art um, that kind of mimicked that, that whole kind of culture and ideas that were just floating around the house. Uh, my very pers first piece that I remember creating was this drawing. I, I found this um, black and white photograph in a magazine of this young black girl wearing this headdress and I drew it and I rendered it very, very well. I took my time with it um, and I showed it to my mother and she was like, this is really good. Show it to your art teacher. And mm. so I showed it to my art teacher and she bumped me up from like art one or whatever I was in <laughs> to AP art. Yeah. And so, and then she just put me in the corner I and just let me do it. I didn't even know they had AP art. I know, right? <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do have AP art. And so she just let me do whatever I wanted to do. I got to just kind of explore and, and expand what I already knew and just and grow from there. And then I decided I want to go to art school, and that was that. How do you feel about art school? Um, <laughs> I didn't I, mean to say it like that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, give me the juice. Give me the tea. I actually enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed my school a lot for many reasons. Um, I mean, it was it was interesting. I had some good experiences there. I had some bad experiences there. I, you know, was usually... If I wasn't the only black student in my class, I was definitely the only black woman student in my mm. class, um, which was something that did not go unnoticed for myself. I was creating very racially charged work. I mean, as much as it could be as like an 18, 19 year old, you know what I mean? <laughs> like you're 18, you're 19 and you're like super black and think you're super radical. For example, we would have uh, an assignment that was about water. We were supposed to create a painting or a piece that depicted water in some form or fashion. Mm. And so you have people, you know, 
doing paintings of lakes and rivers and then I come in and I <laughs> <laughs> and I did a very very good rendering of um, a black and white photograph from the 60s the civil rights era of black students um, being hosed against the wall Ooh, with fire yes. hoses right yeah. so just like super angry and just mm. like super black and just put my work on the wall in the middle of all these other just very pleasant pieces <laughs> like landscapes <laughs> exactly again being the only black person in class i felt like i had this not a duty but i felt like i needed to represent for my blackness somehow mm -hmm. and i and i needed to create work that was strong and for me at that time, the idea of strength in your work, of mm. having a strong piece of work, um, meant it had to be something about something serious. It had to be something angry. It had to be something um, that had the strong emotion behind it. Um, I think I've, I've grown since then. Um, I think my work has evolved. Because even though I'm still talking about similar topics, I think I can do it a little more eloquently now. Mm. Um, whereas before, it was just, yeah. Yeah. I feel know. like that's what happens when <laughs> you leave college. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or when you get to college and you read like your first yeah. anthropology and sociology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, in, I say this all the time, I was insufferable when I was in college. I don't know how my family dealt with me. But everything was a speech. Everything was <laughs> everything was an injustice. It's like, yo, mm -hmm. we in the McDonald's parking lot right now. Like nobody cares. We're just trying to get this chicken happening. <laughs> I feel like college uh, really prepared me for the kinds of people I'd meet in the professional world and the kinds of things I'd have to deal with. Do you mm -hmm. feel like the art school kids you met like maps onto the art world you see now? Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, it was I mean, my classes were mostly full of um, white men, you know, and that's definitely what the art world looks like, mm. you know. So you started off doing mostly painting mm -hmm. portraits. Mm -hmm. And now the thing you're probably most known for is this street art project called Stop Telling Women to Smile. Mm -hmm. Right. How did you get into that? Stop Telling Women to Smile came about because I knew I wanted to do something that was talking about being harassed in the street because it was something I was experiencing Um I had been experiencing for a long time. I feel like I was experiencing it before I moved to Philly. But when I got to Philly, it was mm. an entirely different world. Mm. Philadelphia has a huge mural art scene. And it, it just had me thinking about street art and public art and how people interact with that art, how people engage with it, um, who has access to it, you mm. know, which is something that is totally different from an oil painting, mm. right? I do an oil painting. I am isolated when I'm creating it. And then I'm also putting it in this environment that's pretty isolated, too. Yeah. You put an oil the gallery painting. Space? Exactly. Yeah. The gallery music. Um, that space is usually designated, it seems, for a certain group of folks. Mm -hmm. And I wanted everybody to have access to this work. And that's what public art does. You put it outside in the street, it becomes a part of the environment. Anybody mm -hmm. who walks by it, who lives in this community, has a part in this work. It just made so much sense to me to create work that goes outside in the street, that is addressing something that happens outside mm -hmm. in the street. Mm -hmm. And for, in case some of our listeners have not seen the actual project. Tell us a little bit about what the project actually is. Okay. Well, Stop Telling Them to Smile is a We Paste project. And We Paste, for those who don't know, is an adhesive. It's really just a type of glue that artists use outside. So so is that legal? Um, we Paste specifically? Not when I do it. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm just wondering if there's like a similar like, like Dane element of danger in the same way that we think about like graffiti or something mm. well yeah i mean it's just the same thing as graffiti really okay um there's you know a debate on what is the difference between graffiti and street art i think when people think of graffiti they think of tagging in mm. specific they think of um, exactly spray of. paint you know what i mean you <laughs> yeah. think of like the letterings um you think of street art you think of more painting um and you think of things like you know, these installations with paper, which is what we paste is. So, um, so I'm telling them to smile, it takes these papers, these posters, these prints that I create, and I go outside and I adhere them to walls and outdoors. And what they are featuring are portraits of women who I sit down, I talk with, I interview them, I ask them about their experiences with street harassment. Um, I draw their portraits, and under those portraits, I add text that speak to street harassment, that speaks to their experiences and what they want to say to men outside on the street. So they read things like, stop telling them to smile, uh, my name is not baby, 
women aren't seeking your validation. Women are not outside for your entertainment. Woo! <laughs> Raise hands over here. <laughs> um, yeah, so things like that that are, are really um, kind of reflecting what that woman has gone through and what she has to say about it. What has the response to the project been like? I know that I've seen some pictures of like some um, vandalism mm-hmm. from some pieces. Is that do you find that like once you put them up like a day later they're gone? Yeah, well the defacement happens pretty often now. Mm -hmm. When that first happened, I was I was taken back, I was surprised, Um, but now I just come to expect it. Whenever Mm -hmm. I put up a piece, um, or when other people put up pieces, because it's grown to where now other people are repacing the work too. You just expect for people to come up and write on it. What do they write? Very gendered insults. Mm. So you know. Yeah, which is the main thing that I have a problem with when mm-hmm. it comes to that. Because when it comes to street art, you put something outside, it doesn't really belong to you anymore. Anything mm-hmm. can happen to it. People can rip it down, they can write on it or paint over it, whatever. But with this work in particular, I've noticed that men, boys, whomever, are mm-hmm. coming and writing things on it that are specific to it being a woman on the mm-hmm. piece and it being a woman's voice on the piece. Um, so you have things like slut written on there Jesus. or, you know, people ripping it down or, or drawing this very crude imagery mm-hmm. on there, right? Um, so you missed the point entirely. <laughs> right, <laughs> which in itself kind of highlights the uh, point of it at yeah. the same time. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get feedback from former street harassers, from men? I've had conversations with men who... Uh, genuinely felt like they didn't get it Mm. uh, and like they didn't understand um and would say things to me like well I've done this or I've done that and I don't really get how that's a problem and so we have this conversation where I explain it to them and it does seem like they kind of come to this realization like oh I seem to get it now Mm. now I don't know if they left that conversation and went and harassed somebody on the street (laughs) (laughs) but hopefully they didn't Mm. um yeah I feel like men are usually very defensive mm-hmm. um, and try to turn it around and accuse the woman mm-hmm. for something. Hmm. Well, she must like that attention or she must like that or. Sounds like when you try to talk to white people about race. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Do you have like go to ways you deal with that kind of stuff now? I'm sure you get it all the time. I mean, here's the thing with the conversations with men. I. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> go on. <laughs> I think I've gotten to a point where. I understand if I'm going to continue a conversation with you or not. You know, if I explain to you what street harassment is Mm. and you say, I get it, I understand it, then we can continue on. But if you say to me, I get it, I understand it, and then you add a but, Mm -hmm. then I don't know if I can talk to you anymore after that. Because we're clearly coming from two different worlds, two different foundations, and I can't change what you are thinking. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, it's difficult sometimes trying to articulate something to someone who just does not experience what you experience or what women experience. Um, And trying to get it across to them just how large and how huge and how violent this is. It's not just women being annoyed that men are calling them baby outside on the street. Mm -hmm. It's actually a danger. You know what I mean? Women are actually being assaulted exactly outside on the street and so for you to overlook that simply because you want to continue on doing Mm -hmm. this behavior or living in this world that you live in um i don't i don't know what else to say to you you know Mm -hmm. oh yeah that is so important knowing when to just stop talking to somebody and Mm -hmm. like when to just stop listening it's like okay you know what i don't have to have this conversation with you so i'm not going to Mm -hmm. it's my favorite thing to do online (laughs) (laughs) like you don't know things about this i'm not going to teach you have a good day right it's so free exactly so freeing you were uh commissioned by fusion to continue this project in mexico which mm-hmm. I thought was really exciting. Um, what was that like? That was amazing. Um, it was do you my speak first Spanish? time. I'm learning Spanish okay. at the moment, mm-hmm. but I do That's not allowed. speak it. That's <laughs> <laughs> allowed. But at the time last year when we went, I didn't speak a word of Spanish, even though I took seven years of it in middle school and same, high school. Same. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what was I doing in class? Exactly. Right and so even though there was a language barrier there, we had a translator. Uh, you can still get this sense that they were very enthusiastic about the project. They were very eager to not just talk about street harassment, but to do something about it. Mm. Um, And I think that's why people like this project. Um, I I could sense it there in Mexico City. is because it seems that it's a way to respond, to actually be active and do something about street harassment, Mm -hmm. right? To come out on the offensive and Mm. be like, because no. responding in the moment is yeah. like not right. really an option. This way you can respond safely without being without fear yeah. of being assaulted. Yeah, exactly. You know? What does the street harassment scene, which is kind of a weird phrase to say, but like what does it seem 
like in Mexico, like compared to like here or to Philly or mm-hmm. anywhere else you've been or lived? So I didn't personally experience street harassment, but what I got from the women was that it was very, very, very dire and very drastic what was happening to them. But, you know, I, I feel that way here in New York and I feel that way in Philly. You mm-hmm. know, I feel like it's it's bad. Yeah. And and you really got a sense that it was really bad there from from listening to these women. And what really kind of enforced that to me was the fact that I was talking with women who were older. So mm-hmm. there were women who were in their 20s there, but there were also a few women who were um, 40 and above, one woman in particular who was close to 60. Um, and they were telling me this is still an everyday thing for me and has been for decades. So to know that mm-hmm. I've been experiencing this personally for two thirds of my life and to imagine being 50, almost 60 years old, and it's still mm-hmm. happening to you um, in your workplace when you walk down the street in your home, it's, it's inescapable. Uh, and and that really does something to you emotionally and psychologically. And I was mm-hmm. I was really getting that from these women. Mm. This project has like also kind of made its way into gallery spaces. Mm-hmm. So you do both street art and gallery art, and you bring street art to galleries. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were kind of talking about this a little bit uh, ago when we were talking about the art scene, the art world. Like, how do you think about yourself in the art world? So I know that I'm not going to be ever probably one of the New York art world darlings, right? I didn't go to Yale to get my MFA. Mm. I, you know, haven't had a prestigious residency Mm. um, at some, you know, great institution. So I I didn't follow those rules. If you don't follow those rules, you seem to get shut out. You know, Um, when you apply for these residencies, people are looking at these applications like, what school did you go to? Are you... Do you have your graduate degree? Mm. Um, and if you don't, it's, it's much harder, right? So I, I'm i okay with that. My work just kind of finds its place. That's so um, dope. Uh-huh. Yeah. All the art that I've seen, like, that reflects the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement is mostly from visual artists. Do you feel responsibility as a Black artist to tackle these issues and to make statements and to... Um, like paint portraits of Mike Brown and like all the other um, people that we have unfortunately lost. I do Mm. feel that responsibility and I don't like feeling that responsibility most of the time. Mm. Um, With all of the stories that have been coming out with all of the, you know, deaths and killings of black people, it's been overwhelming first of all i feel like as a black person Mm. and then as an artist you know what i mean just to live you know you you know open your computer and all of a sudden it's a new story and it's just it's 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 traumatizing you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and so as an artist i do feel like okay what am i doing i have to create a piece i have to do a portrait of this person i have to do something um and it's not for myself anymore i feel like i'm creating artwork that is to be useful Mm -hmm. for people you know um so going to a few rallies or protests, I'm, I'm looking at people's signs. It's like I need to create an art piece that people can use for these signs when they come out here and protest. Mm. Um, I have to create work that is useful for people who are out here being active and who are protesting. Like I want to and I have to, but at the same time, it's just like, damn, I also just want to do a painting of like, you know, mm-hmm. something nice and pretty, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And not so charged. Uh, this is our rapid fire, very random uh, question round. Pew, 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 pew. Um, we have to ask you because people get very upset when we don't ask this of our guests. How do you feel about squirrels? I was fine with squirrels until recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what happened, girl? It's a safe space. <laughs> what went down? What Isn't it, I didn't even have like, you know, a particular interaction with a squirrel, but... <laughs> I don't like rats. I hate rats. Mm -hmm. And I realized recently that squirrels are pretty close to rats. Like Mm. they're, you know, (laughs) they're about the same size. They're about the same speed, it seems. Um, (laughs) They're, and rats are pretty squirrely. Like they're like, you know, Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't trust either or. And so squirrels have been, you know, starting to remind remind me of rats recently. And therefore I'm not, really fucking with them too tough <laughs> but i don't Perfect. have like a huge problem with them okay i mean mistrust is a good reason to to not yeah. fuck with something yeah i feel it what do you think is wrong with men 
Big question. That's a huge question. <laughs> what is one of the things? That, one of the things. There you go. Uh, I feel like men are not always aware of the privilege that they have as mm-hmm. men, especially black men. And not Ooh, to like come, speak on not it. to come straight mm. down on black men, but no, I, let's I think talk about that, it <laughs> because I think that black men, you know feel as though because they are under so much oppression Ooh. that they can't be oppressive as well. Mm. Mm. And my glass is so empty right now. And, <laughs> and that's not true. Mm. Right. And so it's it's difficult when you are riding for black men and you feel like you're not getting that same thing back from them because they feel Oof. like they can't be oppressive towards you or mm. that they aren't being oppressive towards you. Mm-hmm. Even though they are. And so one thing that I think that all men, black men included could do better at is is listening to women and and just not talking like listening oh. to women listening to them not talking y'all <laughs> do you hear that and you know because yeah, you have to do that you have to listen I and love this answer. listen and believe <laughs> you know and not be accusatory and yeah. not but take a woman's voice and her story as being valid mm. and that's just it you mm-hmm. know listen and believe what you hear you know don't don't question something i love it thank you for joining us Adiana. thank you so much <laughs> tell folks where they can find you in your work what are you working on now what do you want to plug what's up yeah i am very accessible online um stop telling to smile.com is the site for the project if anyone is interested in that tlinfaz.com is my personal website with the rest of my work I'm also on Twitter I am on Instagram under tlinfaz so you can find me there so I'm about to head to Chicago and work on a project out there I'll be doing a mural and also working with this architect we're going to be building this really cool structure for black women to walk through in outdoor spaces Ooh, so sounds fancy. it should be cool that cool. sounds dope yeah <laughs> so working on a few things and then just painting a bunch and just trying to make stuff. Yeah, Just trying to make stuff. Keep making stuff. The stuff that you make is so beautiful and impactful. And thank, thank you, you for all that you do. Please come back and visit us. I would love to. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Nicole Perkins. And I'm Vimadi Unmi. And we're the hosts of a brand new podcast from BuzzFeed called First Aid Kit. This show is going to validate your thirst, serve you a bowl of eye candy, and introduce you to our very thirsty friends. Thursday, November 2nd. Oh, excuse me. Thirst Day, November 2nd. (laughs) Wherever you find your favorite podcast, you'll find us. First Aid Kit, a podcast about what we do when we lost out loud. So we could sit here and talk about art and blackness and feminism and just dope shit all day. But we have to move on to talk about another way in which men are horrible. Having what do men got to do better at on today's episode? So many things. But today we're focusing on (laughs) the way men use the word females when they mean to say women. Mm. First of all, a copywriter would be like, Is this like a species of elephant? (laughs) Why are we referring to them as females? Exactly. (laughs) Off the bat, it doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. And that ties into how dehumanizing it is because there are female everythings, right? Female wallabies. (laughs) Female. (laughs) Sure, sure. You know, female pit bulls. When you refer to me as a female, then you are literally stripping me of my humanity because it's not evident that you are talking about a female human. When you mean female human... There's a word for that. (laughs) It's women. It's called women. (laughs) Um, The sad part is this isn't just men. Mm. But that's a that's a podcast for another day. True. True. We're going to focus on men today. (laughs) I mean, I think we can talk about it now because it's an example of how like patriarchy fucks up everything. And so not only do you have men running around talking about men, I hate when females do, blah, blah, blah. You also have women who are like trying to be the cool girl and like the the group of boys like, y'all don't really mess with females like that because they run their mouth too much. <laughs> they all about the drama. Did you ever say that? Not that sentence. But <laughs> like I'm not like the other girls or something. Um, I had like a week where I tried to be that girl. <laughs> and then it was just like, this is, is weird and it's stupid. Like I know dope girls. Like why would I like running around bragging about like not hanging out with women who are like me what does that say about how I feel about myself you know 
the equivalent of this would be if we were just like, you know how males be? <laughs> Nobody says right. males that way. Because it's just freaking weird, you know? But like when I'm sitting around talking to my girlfriends, I'm like, hey, man, I met this guy the other day. You know how males whack. be. Right. <laughs> you know? Like, man, I was talking this male the other day. <laughs> Never. Y'all must start saying that. I tried to make that a thing for a while. Mm. And I got bored, like, trying to, like, make it become a thing. It was, like, on Twitter. It was, like, for, like, two weeks instead let's, of my Let's try week. again, guys. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Let's try again. We, from here out, are going to refer <laughs> to horrible men. No, just, to just groups of men. Oh, as okay. As males. Because they use it as just a group of mm-hmm. women mm. is the collective noun. I'm with that. I'm with that. So our collective noun is males. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so maybe men are like, oh, my God. Excuse me. Maybe males are like. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> males are like, oh, my God. What words should I use then? <laughs> my vocabulary is so small. What else do I call the females of my species? <laughs> Kevin and Tracy read a list. A list, a list, a list. a list that Heaven and I put together entitled 29 Things You Can Call Women Instead of Females. Because we really want you all to know that there are so many words in the English language. You do not have to marry yourself to females, especially because it's dumb and it's weird. Uh, women. We mentioned that one. We did mention women. You can call us queens. I will accept dames. Goddesses is a good one. Uh, dragon slayers. Sure. Why not? Khaleesi. Just a collective Khaleesi. <laughs> <laughs> Destiny's children. <laughs> Your Highnesses. That's good. Uh, blessed gladiators of the night. <laughs> I would also answer to divine bodies of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I will answer to perfection. Mm, always, always. As a collective noun. <laughs> um, I would also answer to sufferers of all bullshit. That's real. Mm-hmm. Architects of the cosmos. Hmm. I was talking to a few architects of the cosmos the other day. <laughs> yes, I like the ring of that. <laughs> would also answer to the platonic ideal of forms yes gotta say don't know what it means oh my god i i I snuck that in there (laughs) what does that mean so plato has this theory of (laughs) did you quote plato while casual do you actually want to know yeah so plato has this like that's whatever it's like pretty basic this is theory of forms it's basically like there's the thing but there's the ideal form of the thing so it's like here's a chair but in your mind you have an image of the ideal form of a chair Mm mm-hmm It comes up casually in conversation as like a platonic ideal, just like as a saying for ideal. Mm -hmm. But it does have a very specific, like rooted philosophical conversation, which I find boring. (laughs) So I'm using it in a casual way. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't really care about Plato's philosophy. Well, you, I'm very impressed that you just discussed Plato. What is the point of your expensive ass education? You can't talk about Plato sometimes. (laughs) Yes. Right. Uh, What else would I respond to? How about your name? You know what? That's a novel idea, Tracy. Have at it. Have at it. I know it just blew your mind. Calling women their names? What? <laughs> I don't know, guys. Kind of crazy. I don't know if it's going. I don't know if it's going to take. I off. would also respond to Optimus Prime. <laughs> I was talking with Optimus Prime the other day. <laughs> women, collective women. <laughs> I'm going to call you Optimus Prime from Please. here out. Please. I promise you. I That's promise. the only name I will <laughs> respond to. <laughs> All right, heaven, it's that time again. What time is it? Time to bet on Ram. Who are you buying around for this week? So I'm buying around for the Lion King 2 soundtrack. <gasps> oh which my gosh. I play at least like once a week in my in my like workspace. And I think people think I'm just like bopping around <laughs> to like walk up and it's just like I love that Lion King 2 jams. <laughs> oh, so man. if you are a person who enjoys joy, you have already loved the Lion King 1 soundtrack so Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about that we don't need to Mm -hmm. if you don't have those bops in your life like I don't know (laughs) what kind of life you're living be prepared that song single handedly is probably responsible for my career (laughs) 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 I listened to that like every day as a child I'm not even joking that's how I learned the phrase quid pro quo aww because Scar was like talking about killing someone yeah (laughs) To a bunch of children. Yeah. Disney's fucked up. Anyways, Lion King 2 slept on soundtrack. Agreed. Everyone always talks about the first one. Mm-hmm. You got the still the like the love songs like 
um, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, but like You Bendy. <laughs> Do you remember? Mm-hmm. In You Bendy. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I oh love my that gosh, song. it was so beautiful. Thank you. In your Bendy. In your Bendy. In your Bendy. And like Love Will Find a Way. These are like slept on jams. I can't <laughs> say it any other way. Um, and then it gets like really dramatic. Like he's not one of us. I can still like see the like the entire animal kingdom shunning <laughs> Kovu. <laughs> also, Kovu was hot. We can talk about that another day. Hey, hot cartoon characters. We can talk about that another day. Yes. But I just I just want to say, like, you know, maybe you're like, wow, I haven't thought about The Lion King 2 in a while. Mm-hmm. I just want to jog your memory. You should be listening to that every day at work, every day in your life. Mm-hmm. And we are one, you and I. <laughs> My favorite song from that soundtrack, and I think it's because it's one of the only ones I can really remember well, is the one where they were kicking the one lion out of the group. That's, and it was like the, the... He's not one of us. Yeah. The entire animal kingdom. They were like, get the fuck out. <laughs> it that was so, so dramatic. <laughs> and it started off as like... <laughs> like all the elephants are stomping. It's like, oh shit, what's about to happen? <laughs> they called him my kind of names. He was a, he was an outcast. And then they, they, I think I think the ostriches in the background were like disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is a great song. Uh, also to play at karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> if your karaoke place loves uh, Lion King to it like I do. Have you been at a karaoke place that plays a soundtrack? I've been to one. <gasps> no way. Yes. Amazing. Shout out to that karaoke bar. Um, but yeah. Also, we will never speak of Lion King one and a half. I just what? needed to that say that on thing? the record. <laughs> that happened? We only acknowledge Lion King one and two. One uh, and listen to half. both soundtracks. Get your life together. I'm going to Google one and a half now. I didn't it's know horrible. Don't even look at it. <laughs> it's a disgrace to the Lion King. <laughs> Clearly, you know the Lion King means a lot to I me. I know. I know you watched one and a half. I didn't even know that that existed. It's just oh, it's such a betrayal mm. of the integrity of the Lion King. <laughs> Anyways, we don't need to go into all of this. <laughs> Who are you buying around for, Tracy? I also have a musical round today. Ooh. I want to buy a round for a song called A Toast to the People. And it was recorded by Gil Scott Heron and... Um, Brian Jackson in 1976, so it's been a while. Um, I love Gil Scott Heron's music mm. so, so much. He, if you're not familiar, was a spoken word poet and also a singer and musician back in the 70s, and a lot of his stuff, if not everything, was like really, really politically charged. Um, and it's, it's just amazing to kind of um, watch history happen when you listen to like one of his albums you know like he mm. talks about the blighting of Detroit in one song and then he also has some songs that are just like really happy and positive and uplifting so one of the songs on this album um, is called A Toast to the People and um, I listened to it for the first time in years a couple days ago and so it was the first time since the Black Lives Matter movement happened and since um Mike Brown was killed that I've heard this song and it just resonates like so like like it almost moved me to tears to listen to Brian Jackson has one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard in my life. And it's just them for the most part and a piano and like a little bit of drum in the background. And it's mostly Brian Jackson singing. It's a toast to black people who have been like oppressed and beaten up and mowed down in like the primes of their lives and like mothers who have lost kids, fathers who have lost kids. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the, the lyrics just resonate so much with what's going on now. There is a line that says... Ever since we came to this land, this country has ruled the day that we would stand as one and raise our voices and say, there won't be no more killing, there won't be no more talk of class. Your sons and your daughters won't die in the hourglass. Mm. And it's just like so perfect, you know? It's heavy because it's talking about some really heavy stuff. But by the end, it kind of like, it doesn't pick up tempo-wise, but like the mood of it sort of picks up.
There's another section towards the end where they name um, the names of a bunch of people that I don't know. Mm. And you could tell that they were like names of black people who had probably, I mean, to me it felt oh like God. they had probably like been victims of police brutality or just victims of a really unfair society. There are so many other Mike Browns. There are so many other Sandra Blands, you know, and like nobody is, we don't know their names because there's so many of them, you know, like we can't keep everyone's names in our heads all the time. And so I like that this song, at least to me, feels like, and I mean, they could have been like big stories back then, I don't know. But it, at least to me feels like, you know, somebody's like, even the ones who passed quietly, like we know you, we see you, we feel that you're not here anymore. You know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, I'm, that's a lot of editorializing coming from me that may or may not be true. No, I feel like that's in the spirit of the song. And also this song made me think about um, Janelle Monae and Wonderland's song, Hell You Talking About, which is um, them just like screaming and repeating the names of like the movement, like Mike Brown and Sandra Bland, just over and over again and insisting that their names be said and be heard. And it's both kind of inspiring and really sad to see this repeated in mm. music um, so far apart, like 30 some odd years apart. So please listen to the song. It is, it's beautiful. Listen to all of you got here and stuff. Word. So kind of a heavy note to end on, but... Um, Let's lighten it up a little bit. I think you guys are great. I love what you're doing with your hair. What? This shirt is just working. I'm being nice to the listeners. I just want oh, to I thought you were hands. talking to me, but then you... You too, of course. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but then I was like, wait, that's not towards me? <laughs> Gosh. For everyone. For everyone. You looking um, great. Heaven, we did it. We did it. Heaven, we made it. Hey. Heaven, we made it. I need Drake to do a remix of that just for us. <laughs> it, it will happen. I'm Drake and Soldier Boy. <laughs> right. That song also has some of the best best ad libs. Anyways, <laughs> um, as always, shout out to the Pod Squad. Pod Squad, Pod Squad. This podcast is produced by Eleanor Kagan. Yay! With editorial oversight by Jenna Weiss Berman. Production support comes from Julia Furlan and our newest member of the Pod Squad, Meg Kramer, everyone. Yay. Hey! Ow, ow. Guys, everyone, welcome Meg. We're so happy she's here. Yay! Bwah, 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 bwah. Shout out to Paul who rests at Argo Studios. Yay, Paul! Shout out to Tatiana for stopping by. Yay! Shout out to Optimus Prime. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out. Wait, what did you want? Oh, I can't remember. I think I'll stick with the Tracy. That really works for okay. me. Okay. Shout out to the Tracy. Hey! Shout out to our amazing in-house musicians, Jean Gray, the one and only. You can follow her at Jean Greasy. And Don Will of the Almighty Tanya Morgan. You can follow him at Don Will. That's D-O-N-W-I-L-L. So if you're wondering where this fire-ass song came from that you're listening to, one of our listeners made it. Her Twitter name is Sensa Chanel, and this is from the Pigeon episode of Tracy's Animal Corner, where we were like, somebody needs to make a trap remix of this, and she did, and it's amazing. So thank you to Miss Chanel. Please follow her on Twitter at S-E-N-S-A-C-H-A-N-E-L-L. Yo, we have the best fans. Pigeon, pigeon. water do some stretching mm-hmm. i don't think we stretch enough as a people we take your meds Drink eat some, some cheese maybe just some- mm-hmm. cheese is delicious eat a croissant and can you put cheese on the croissant eat a bagel eh. a biscuit a biscuit yes. i will we eat a biscuit. settle on biscuits <laughs> <laughs> and come back next week we will miss you so much as always you can find us at heaven rants I like the noun. It's like the verb. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me at Brogy McPoverty. Hit us up at Another Round on Twitter, Another Round on Facebook. And if you like the show, please rate us on iTunes. Leave a little review. Yes. It and means email a lot us. To us. Yes. Email us as well. Um, another round at BuzzFeed.com. This round of credits has been tough. Yeah, this is tougher than the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we did it. I think we did it. I think that's the end. Um, and thanks for listening, y'all. We love you.
Can I tell you a few of my favorite Southern phrases? Please. If brains were leather, he couldn't saddle a June bug. Oh my God. <laughs> That's like five <laughs> metaphors in one. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, and then another one of my favorites is he couldn't pour piss out of a boot if the instructions were on the heel. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Isn't it poetry? I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you.